All right. Thanks very much for coming. Uh, we're going to be talking today about a project called Chameleon. I'm Kate Cahey. I am PI of this project. It's an NSF-funded project to build an open cloud testbed. This is Pierre Rito. Pierre is the uh, DevOps lead on Chameleon and works with uh, multiple OpenStack teams uh, on the implementation thereof. We're both from uh, University of Chicago and Argonne National Labs, so we work with HPC communities and scientific communities as well. So uh, Chameleon is a testbed. You know, feel free to hang around here. Or you know. Chameleon is a testbed uh, for computer science experimentation. It's a project of five different teams, five different institutions. University of Chicago, Texas Advanced Computing Center, which is one of the largest supercomputing centers in the country. Um, uh, Ohio State University, DK Panda is going to be talking about fast virtualization interconnect later today. He's the co-PI on this project, uh, UTSA, and Northwestern University. So um, I wanted to start off with a little bit of genesis of uh, why building a, an experimental testbed for uh, computer science. Um, and, and this has been sort of my personal quest for a good testbed for the types of experiments that we're running. So my team has been working on infrastructure as a service cloud computing for a very long time. Um, we produced the first open source infrastructure as a service uh, implementation called Nimbus. So something very much like, like OpenStack, except it was released uh, 12 years ago. Um, and, oh, I see that... Uh, one of the bullets uh, got missing, uh, but that's okay. I'll try to talk over this. Didn't happen before. Um, and, and finding a good test bed for uh, experimental computer science was a bit of a personal quest. So back 12 years ago, uh, when we were building uh, infrastructure as a service systems, we might wanted to make those systems available to uh, scientific communities that we work with uh, a lot. And there was just no hardware that we could run on. We also wanted to run tests comparing the overhead of virtualization, overhead of, say, running MPI uh, programs in virtualization and on bare metal. And we could not do that. We just simply did not have a test bed at all. So after a little while of this, some people at Argonne said, hey, we've got some um, older computers that uh, you can use. We can give it to you. You're going to set it up as a cluster or a cloud or you know, whatever you want to call it, and you can run experiments on that. And that's the missing bullet here. And that was the case of missing hardware virtualization. So hardware virtualization came out around that time. And comparing the performance um, of uh, virtualization on machines that were not equipped with hardware virtualization did not really make much sense. You could run much better, more impactful results on something else, right? So now we had hardware, but it was just too old to produce uh, impactful results. Um, so the next thing that happened is I said, well, we obviously can't go on like this. Let me write a proposal to the National Science Foundation to get some resources um, uh, for our group. And I did that, and the proposal was awarded. But the programs that award um, hardware for individual investigators give you just very little hardware. You know, so, so we got uh, something like four or six machines that we still have, and we were able to now run experiments on bare metal, but on known for nodes. So we were writing a lot of papers saying, well, here's a simulation, and then we confirmed this experimentally on four nodes, uh, but we're very optimistic that we'll scale beyond that, right? So uh, not great papers, in other words. So, we had, we had two small test beds now. So uh, some eight years ago, there was an opportunity for me to get involved in a project called Future Grid, which was building an experimental test bed for computer science. But the problem is that what Future Grid eventually built was a series of virtualized clouds. And when you write in, run in a virtualized cloud, like in Amazon, for example, uh, your results are going to be impacted by other people who are sharing the cloud with you, and they're going to be impacted by overhead from, um, uh, from the virtualization, from the hypervisor. So that was not good either. And, and so in this process, over many years, we were finding out that while we can think, we can be very creative and think of fantastic computer science experiments that we could run, in practice, the experiments that we're going to be able to run will be limited by, by our access to resources, right? We can think about whatever, but in practice, we can run only, only the things that we have resources to run. 
So hence, uh, a couple of years ago, when the opportunity offered to create a real test bed for uh, computer science experiments, I jumped on it. And we designed um, a test bed um, strategy around the following five points. So first of all, we wanted the test bed to be very large scale, as large scale as we could, could afford, right? No more four node experiments. And the test bed as it is today has about 600 nodes, about 15,000 cores, five petabytes of storage, and all of that is distributed over two sites, TAC and University of Chicago, that are connected by a 100 gigabits per second network. So you can run experiments on large scale. Most of the nodes are concentrated in one homogeneous partition, so you can scale your experiments. Um, secondly, we wanted the testbed to be deeply reconfigurable. So you get access to bare metal nodes and, and can reconfigure those nodes. You can reboot from a different kernel. Uh, you get console access to uh, interact with your experiments better. Uh, you can run at a, at a uh, reconfigure things at a very deep level. So uh, no more shared clouds. You can run in an isolated environment and, and no more clouds that, or, or resources that you can only submit a job to. Um, and then thirdly, we wanted this, uh, this test bed to be connected. In other words, not just provide deep reconfiguration capabilities, but also be more of a one-stop shopping for experimental computer science. So uh, some of our users told us that hardware was, yes, something that they needed very much, but they had even deeper needs. You know, cloud computing is a new, relatively new area. And they said, well, what we really want are, for example, traces that characterize traffic in a, in a typical data center and we don't have those. There's not something like parallel workload archive for cloud computing. Um, and, but we also want to provide appliances or images for users so that you come to the test, but you don't have to develop everything from scratch. If you want to, to uh, deploy uh, OpenStack at bare metal, you can do that. Your private own isolated installation of OpenStack. If you want to deploy MPI, you can also do that. And you can do that with images that were already pre-configured for you. And then finally, we're beginning now to develop tools that give you better access to the instrumentation of your experiments and better access to reproducibility and repeatability so that you can wrap up your experiment very easily, give those artifacts to somebody else, and they can come back to the testbed and repeat the experiment you are running. And then we wanted the testbed to be sustainable. This is why we're building an OpenStack. And we also wanted it to be open. And the testbed is available to all US researchers or collaborators, right? So if you're not in the US, you collaborate with somebody, such as, for example, you talk to them at the OpenStack Summit, you can use the test bed. So here's a quick tour of the uh, Chameleon hardware uh, to give you a little bit more detail of what we have. So the basic building block of Chameleon is something that we call a standard cloud unit. This is essentially a rack. It has um, uh, 42 compute nodes. Those are Intel Haswell nodes, 24 core, 128 gigabit um, uh, memory. Um, and, and then um, each uh, rack also has four storage nodes. Those are also Intel Haswells, but each storage node also has 16 two terabyte drives. So essentially each storage node has very high bandwidth uh, access to storage. You can allocate those nodes, you can just allocate a few nodes, you can allocate a whole rack, you can allocate multiple racks, you can allocate different nodes across racks. So for example, you could allocate several storage nodes, get a high bandwidth IO cluster. We've got 10 of those racks, 10 of those standard cloud units at TAC, and we've got two of those at University of Chicago. So at TAC, we've got this large homogeneous partition that I mentioned earlier on. You can run uh, codes and you can see whether they scale. Or you can, you can have a large installation of OpenStack, for example, and experiment with that. So in addition to those basic building blocks, we also have a global store of 3.5 petabytes. And th this is global storage that is used for uh, images for experimental data uh, for any artifacts that you may want to use. And in addition to that, we also have heterogeneous hardware, right? Because there's only so much interest in running with homogeneous hardware. And the heterogeneous units um, include uh, nodes with memory hierarchies. So those nodes have almost one terabyte of, of RAM. They have NVMe, they have single state drives, they have HDDs. So you can experiment with different uh, memory hierarchies. And they also, we also have nodes with GPUs, three different types of GPUs, 20 GPU nodes, uh, a cluster of, of 16 Pascal GPUs, if you uh, need that for some reason. And we've got four FPGAs, 
we've got arms and we've got uh, arms uh, for for uh, low um, uh, low power experiments. We've got atoms. We've got uh, low power xeons. So we've got a variety at smaller scales, a variety of different architectures that you can experiment with uh, for different purposes. Um, and here is just a quick overview of all the things that I just mentioned. We've got this large uh, homogeneous partition first. Uh, then we have the shared infrastructure, the, uh, the global store where you can save your experimental data. And then some of the uh, homogeneous nodes were decorated with heterogeneous elements. So for example, one rack has InfiniBand. You can run experiments with InfiniBand. Compare that with Ethernet um, and, and see what the impact is. Uh, we've got those different storage hierarchy nodes. And we've got the, then various different uh, heterogeneous architectures. So this is our, our large-scale testbed that I think anybody in this room would be able to use. So secondly, we needed to provide deep reconfigurability so that our users can, can reconfigure the testbed at a, at a deep level. So if you think about a typical computer science experiments, you first design the experiment, then you say, well, what, what hardware can I get? What, what is the hardware that I can get in practice to run this experiment on? Then you somehow uh, provision that hardware, take temporary ownership of that hardware, reconfigure it, and eventually you run your experiment, you monitor it, and as often as not, go back to the drawing board and, and design and run another experiment. So first, for resource discovery, what people typically want is, is a very fine-grained description of those resources, sometimes down to the level of serial numbers of individual components, so that if somebody um, exchanges the component, upgrades it, for example, uh, you can find out about it. And this description, of course, at count age, it has to be up to date. You have to know exactly what you're running on. But it's good for that description also to be versioned, so that if the um, components in the testbed change and you go back to your experiment and it returns different results, you can at a glance tell whether something changed or not. Um, secondly, when you provision the resources, of course, all of us would like to come to the testbed and get the resources that we want on demand. So, uh, uh, you know, right, right when we ask for them. But if you really want to reserve hundreds of nodes, uh, you may have to wait a little bit because at any time when you come to the testbed, that, that testbed might be fragmented, other people may be running. So that's when you may want to do an advanced reservation. If you think ahead long enough, those people will have finished and all of the testbed will be available and at some point you can make um, a very large reservation. The, the advanced reservations are also extremely useful for um, sharing heterogeneous components as well. So for example, GPUs right now are very heavily, very popular resource on our testbed and we've got typically several um, uh, different advanced reservations, several uh, deep uh, from users who are interested in using. So advanced reservation on demand access, and then of course very important also is isolation. You want to run in isolated environments, not be impacted by wh what other users are doing. And you can do that on Chameleon, you can, um, you can have individual nodes, but like I said, you can also get the whole rack when even your network is not going to be, uh, is going to be safe from other users, it's not going to be impacted by them. All right, so you provision those resources, now what, how do you reconfigure them? Well, you'd like to have access to deep reconfigurability, uh, reconfigure uh, the resources at a very low level. Um, as I said, when you come to the test bed, you don't want to start working from scratch. It's good to have um, uh, some base images uh, and preferably images that represent the applications that you want to work with. Um, when you modify those images or appliances, you want to be able to save your work. So in other words, you need to snapshot them. Um, and, and you also want support for, for what we call complex appliances. So very frequently, you deploy something like an MPI cluster or a cluster with a batch scheduler on it or, or an OpenStack installation. Right? Those are uh, images that are combined in various ways. You don't want to have to by hand configure the relationships between the various nodes. It, preferably, that happens out of the box. And, and finally, it's good to have network isolation, right? You can stand up your own DNS server without conflicting with anybody else's DNS server. And then on the monitoring angle, once you start running your experiment, uh, you want access to hardware metrics, you want to be able to aggregate them in some ways and, and archive them finally. So this is how we build the system. This is the, uh, the diagram of the implementation of the system, and I'll start with, uh, 
with the component that is uh, common to all the test beds with user services. So user services allow you to create accounts, allow you to create projects on the test bed. This is the part of the test bed that is the same for any test bed, you know, whether you're serving uh, resources to the main sciences or, or to uh, experimental computer science. And for that, we're using um, a system called TAS, which keeps track of user accounts, is essentially equivalent of Keynote, but it provides much richer functionality, um, uh, more information about the accounts that you create. Um, and, and you've got, um, we also have, uh, we're using resource trackers for users to interact with the support team. And so, you know, at this point, users are able to create account, interact with the support team, are not able to do anything else. To do anything else, they need to use the discovery services, which are the, um, the, the uh, yellow box uh, which, for which we use uh, Grid 5000 implementation. Grid 5000 is a project from France, from INRIA, uh, that has developed a very good resource model and many tools that, that allow us to uh, find out about those resources. Um, and then after that, everything is pretty much open stack. So in other words, we use Blazar, Nova, and, and Swift for resource uh, provisioning. Uh, we contributed to both Blazar and Nova uh, in order to make those components um, adaptable to our needs. Uh, we use Ironic for configuration management, as well as, of course, uh, Glance and Heat for orchestration and, and Neutron for networking, and we use Solometer for uh, monitoring. And those components were combined so that uh, we can synchronize the accounts created by uh, our own account system with Keystone, and that happens about every three minutes. Account information is pulled to Keystone. Uh, we can also synchronize uh, the uh, resource representation that is produced from Grid 5000 with Blazar every time that uh, that, that uh, information changes. All right, and so now I'm going to talk, we're going to talk a little bit about the specific implementation that um, uh, we contributed to OpenStack to provide the uh, resource provisioning and resource configuration capabilities. And Pierre, who's been leading this effort, is going to tell us uh, about this. Thank you, Kate. So uh, first for the provisioning. So um, what we give to the user, the abstraction that we give them is a lease. And uh, with a lease that gives you access to uh, some, some resources in the testbed. And there are two kinds of reservations that we can provide that way. Um, one is advanced reservation, and that facil facilitates getting a large amount of resources in the future, as Kate explained. And on demand, which uh, is a special case of advanced reservation, it's really an advanced reservation that starts now. And with those reservations, the users get exclusive access to the resources, and that gives them isolation. Uh, we have a fine grain for uh, deciding which kind of resources you might want. So you can ask for different node types. Uh, you can say, I want uh, X compute nodes and uh, Y storage nodes, and design your experiment that way. To implement that, uh, we used the, a combination of Nova, obviously, and the Blazar project. So Blazar, um, which used to be called Climate, uh, was a project that was started, I think, in 2013. And it was active for a couple of years. And then um, it became inactive. And at the beginning of Chameleon, we saw that it really fulfilled a lot of our needs. So um, we built Chameleon on top of it. Um, and since then, we've worked with the community to revive it and uh, make it uh, a, a, an active OpenStack project. So I'm part of the uh, core reviewing team, uh, together with uh, other contributors from NTT and NEC. And we're seeing more and more interest uh, in Blazor. So there are several sessions this week that uh, were uh, discussing how Blazor could fulfill different needs in, uh, in OpenStack. Uh, in terms of what we did inside of Chameleon, and uh, we're going to contribute those, uh, those changes in the near future, uh, we have an extension to the Horizon panel that gives you a calendar view. So that's what you can see on the right-hand side of this slide. So you, you can see what resources are being uh, reserved and for how long. And it 
it helps you to, uh, to plan your experiments. We also extended Blaze out to support our uh, policy, uh, our usage policies. So for example, we have limitations to how long um, resources can be res uh, reserved for. Um, so all of this has been integrated in, uh, in Blazor, and um, we're designing the way this is going to be supported upstream. Uh, so in Chameleon, we have specific policies, but we want everyone to be able to contribute their own policies. So some kind of pluggable implementation will be designed. So that's for all the provisioning. And then for the configuration and interaction with the resources, uh, we really wanted to give access um, to, to the resources with a lot of control. So the users of Chameleon should be able to reboot on a custom kernel, access the console to uh, debug their recompiled kernel, and so on. And once they've built an image that they, can, they want to reuse for their experiment, they need to be able to snapshot it. Otherwise, they will redo their work over and over. It was also critical that we were able to deploy different environments that we call appliances in Chameleon into a single lease because a common pattern in uh, computer science research is to uh, compare different environments and different scenarios and get that uh, into, um, into results for a paper. And you don't necessarily want to have different leases for each one. Um, so there, there needs to be a, an end to one mapping there. We uh, also uh, want to have a, an appliance catalog and be able to manage those appliances and make them discoverable and shareable with the rest of the community. Uh, being able to deploy complex appliances. So those are things like virtual clusters or complex software stacks like, well, OpenStack is uh, uh, more complex than just a hello world, obviously. Um, or things like Hadoop. Uh, which require a lot of coordination between different nodes. So with uh, controller nodes, compute nodes, storage nodes, all working together to build one software stack. Um, and finally, uh, being able to support network isolation uh, to make sure that the users cannot in, um, impact other users during their experiment. So to, to implement all of this, uh, we are relying on OpenStack services. So there is Ironic, Neutron, Glens. Um, so Ironic, obviously, for bare metal. Neutron for managing the network. Uh, Glens is used to store the appliances. And then we have in our Chameleon portal uh, some uh, extensions to make them dis discoverable. Uh, metadata server for some of the simple configuration of appliances and then for complex configuration we use heat to do the orchestration. Um, for Ironic um, we added snapshotting. Um, the appliance management and catalog as I said this is managed in our user portal which is separate from, uh, from OpenStack and the, the dynamic VLANs where uh, implemented as a combination of changes to Neutron and Ironic. We don't support reconfiguring BIOSes yet, but that's on our um, time, uh, on our future plans. Um, so users will be able to provide a specific configuration, like I don't want uh, hyper-threading to, uh, to be on, and then it will be enacted for them by the system. So I'll say a few words about um, what we did with Ironic. So Ironic doesn't support snapshotting. If you go to a KVM cloud, you have a button called Create Snapshot in the web interface, and you click it and you get a snapshot. This doesn't work with Ironic. So what we did is we uh, wrote a, a small script that we put inside all our appliances, and it uses libguestfs tools to create a table of the entire root file system, puts this into a QCO2 image, uploads it to Glance, and 
basically this does the this gives you the same result as doing the create snapshots um, and it, it supports both whole disk images those are images that have an MBR and different a number of partitions in it or partition images which are a file system and a kernel and a RAM disk which can both be deployed by Aronix so we, we are able to support both. For network isolations, um, so we use uh, uh, VLANs that are dynamically allocated and to do that we configure Neutron to use the Open Daylight plugin and then we have an open daylight controller that we extended to be able to change the VLAN port tagging on our Dell switch. And Ironic can trigger those updates after the, the deployment of the nodes. So it's able to put the, the resources in the, into a, a VLAN that is dedicated for a specific user. This is something that we did on our installation, which is based on OpenStack Liberty. And uh, in the meantime, the community of Ironic and Neutron has worked together to develop something that's called multi-tenant bare metal networking. And it's been released in Okata. So it's possible that we will move to this implementation in the future. We haven't evaluated yet. Um, so we don't know if it's completely superseding what we have. Um, there are still a few things that we would like to have in Ironic. I'll mention the three of them. So one of them is support for multiple networks. At the moment, you get only one network. Uh, so you get a shared uh, control and data plane on your uh, on the machines that you deploy. And for some experiments, that's a problem. Like if you want to deploy OpenStack on Chameleon, then you have to share this same link for everything and researchers would like to be able to access different interfaces. Uh, I know it's being worked on, there is a spec uh, that has been approved for, uh, for our running, so I'm expecting that it will be there in the future. Uh, we are saying that Ironic is not the greatest at uh, supporting failures, so the problem with managing bare metal is that you get a kind of failure that you wouldn't get uh, with virtual machines. So IPMI sometimes doesn't reply in a timely fashion. And Ironic has some full tolerance mechanism that retries, but after a few retries, it will give up. And then the node is marked as being down and only administrator can put it back on. So we would like to have some kind of healing process in Ironic. And finally, um, because our users do a lot of deployment and they might do it repeatedly to test different environments, if we can reduce as much as possible the deployment time, that would be great. So if there was support for uh, using kexec in Ironic, then um, we could uh, shave a few minutes off the deployment. Uh, a few words about appliances. So the basic um, Chameleon appliance is a bare metal image, um, QCO2, uh, and it's compatible between the two sites, UC and TAC. It includes several different tools. We have CC checks, which verifies that the hardware is matching what's in the resource description that's managed by the Grid 5000 um, uh, component that Kate uh, talked about. So it allows to see when, for example, a, a RAM uh, module might not have initialized correctly and you get a bit more RAM that you would expect, or when components have been changed by the administrator and just hasn't been reflected. Then we have the snapshot utility that I talked about. We have something to measure power uh, utilization of uh, CPU. Uh, we have an agent that talks with Cilometer and that exports many different metrics like CPU utilization, RAM utilization, I.O., etc. And finally, for uh, orchestration, we need to have the heat agent running in there. You want to? Right. 
<clears throat> so quickly, uh, a few stats about Chameleon, and, and really the most important uh, message to take from this is that we announced public availability about a year and a half ago, and today have uh, about 1,400 users and, and 200 uh, different research and education projects. Um, a quick vignette of uh, what our users are doing. So here's an example. It's, it's a project that a student from University of Pittsburgh was doing. Um, her name was Yu Yu Zhu, and she was uh, comparing the performance of, of Docker and KVM. So she was trying to nail down the trade-offs between containerization and virtualization. And what she needed was um, uh, a test that supported bare metal reconfiguration. She needed to customize the kernel to reboot the kernel with different parameters in order to uh, support KVM well. To, uh, to capture the performance trade-offs. She needed console access to debug her uh, setup, um, up-to-date hardware, and she needed to, large, uh, to, to run on large partitions. So you can see a graph from, from the poster. She's presenting at supercomputing there, and it has uh, comparisons on 64 nodes. Here's another project from Swan Paranu at Argonne National Lab. He's working on developing um, exascale operating systems. Argonne National Lab is, of course, one of the largest um, HPC centers in the nation, uh, a, a lot of research on that there. And he had pretty much the same um, uh, requirements as UU, but in his case, he would do uh, what Pierre earlier mentioned is a very common pattern. He would reboot the operating system with multiple um, arguments, um, and, and so uh, with multiple kernel parameters over and over again and, and try different approaches with that. So that's again him uh, presenting a demo and, and some um, some um, um, uh, graphs from his work. Um, a, few, a few words on traces. Yeah, so um, Kate mentioned at the beginning we uh, want to have a, 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 an archive with uh, traces from cloud workloads. So this is an activity that we do in the context of science, the OpenStack Scientific Working Group. Uh, so far we've um, reviewed what traces already exist for HPC and grid computing to see how it's, they are used in publications today, and we're working on defining a trace format similar to those traces, but that would uh, work for uh, clouds and in particular for OpenStack. So the idea is uh, that uh, we will be able to export uh, information from the Nova database and put it in traces that can then be replayed. Possibly also combining with metrics uh, from telemetry uh, in OpenStack so that you can also know not just what instances were deployed, but what kind of workload was running inside those instances. And then to be able to replay, uh, we're looking at uh, things like Rally, or uh, there is something from the OpenStack Innovation Center uh, to, um, uh, to generate workloads. And um, we would like if you want to contribute your, uh, your yep. traces. Um. And, and so traces are one of the ways in which we're trying to build a connected instrument, an instrument that will provide more of a bridge to research. But another thing um, that we're trying to do is, at this point, we have the core capabilities of Chameleon. So we're providing for the basic need of, I need to run my experiment somewhere. But if you think about a, a fully fledged scientific instrument, it has it, it allows you to observe and measure various relevant phenomena. So what does that mean? Um, so it turns out that everything you do on the test bed is recorded somewhere in the logs, right? When you provision resources, it's recorded. When you deploy a, an appliance, an image, it's recorded. What you're deploying, your monitoring information gets recorded. And it's, it's currently captured in the test bed, but it's not provided in a very intuitive fashion. So what we're trying to do is take all that information from the test bed, consolidate it, and filter it to the needs of a specific user, and give them an experiment summary that they can integrate with something like um, Jupyter Notebook or Grafana. And, and for example, right here, let me see if I can start it from here. So right here, we've got a quick screencast that, that shows you the, the, uh, the time series of various information produced um, by your experiment, right? And, and this experiment happens to be 
on power measurement. So somebody is stressing the system, measuring the power, but uh, the measurement information that we get from the system as well is about uh, CPU utilization, memory utilization, and so forth. So you can easily just simply pull up those graphs without having to instrument anything and get that information from the system, and you get a record of everything you've done during this experiment, you can record it like a screencast by pushing a button. It's, this is where I started experimenting, this is what I ran next, and so forth. And, and you can pull up, and at, you, you can get the information of what the load was on the system at, at any time. So I'll, I'll move on in the interest of time. So you can get those displays, which of course shortens the time from the data that you're producing to insight. But most importantly, you get this information and it's recorded and now you can replay it. Or you can give it to somebody in a form that allows them to replay your experiment very easily. So perhaps they are trying to improve on some measurements or some algorithm that you developed. They can take your exact experimental setup and in that setup rerun their, uh, their own work. So um, a few words who can use uh, Chameleon, uh, like I said earlier, any US research or collaborator where collaboration is defined very, very broadly. Uh, it, you know, it could be as easy as, as talking to somebody at a conference like the OpenStack Summit, for example. Uh, there are various allocations that uh, the project gets and, and various limits on usage that um, you know, allow us to provide fairness to all users. I'll skip over the next slide, uh, quick summary. Um, what we have provided is an open experimental test bed. So again, probably everybody in this room uh, can use it for computer science research. Um, our, our, um, uh, the, the things that we wanted to specifically provide is large scale and deep reconfigurability, as well as sustainable operations model. And from that perspective, our adventure with OpenStack, using OpenStack and then also contributing back to OpenStack as part of the Blazor projects, uh, worked out very well for us. So we're, we're really happy to be working with the community. And now that allows us to turn our attention to provide more of a connectedness um, uh, dimension to the instrument and, and, and give users a uh, faster uh, pathway from data to insight. And, and one last thing that I wanted to say is, um, is uh, draw your attention to something that Winston Churchill was once said about buildings. He said, we shape our buildings, thereafter the buildings shape us. And he said that about the House of Camels, which was destroyed during the Second World War. When they were rebuilding it, he argued for it to be rebuilt in the form in which it was originally conceived. So for example, uh, it's a very small room. Everybody's within um, shouting distance of each other. Right? And that eliminates the need to go out to the dais and talk to a microphone and so forth. And allows for a much more spontaneous conversation, a sort of blow-by-blow -blow conversation. And if you, ever, if you ever watch the discussions that happen in that building, that actually does happen. So it's, it's, it's very spontaneous, right? So it's an example of how shaping a building shapes the character of political debate. And if that's true about buildings, it's so much more true about test beds. And if you go back to what I said at the beginning of the talk about um, you know, uh, what, what, our, what we can conceive, the experiments we can conceive of are essentially unlimited, but in practice they are limited to what we can do, it's not strictly speaking true. Because um, eventually we learn our, our creativity, our ability to innovate adapts to what we can use to run our experiments on. And, and uh, it becomes stunted. If, you know, if I have only four nodes to, to run my experiments on, I'm not going to conceive of nodes that need 400 nodes because I just know that I won't get enough resources to run them. So in, eventually you start dreaming small where we should all be dreaming big. And so that's what we're trying to do in this test bed is expands people's ability to run experiments, expand their uh, imagination and, and allow all of us to uh, uh, dream big. So that's what we have for today and I will take questions now. Any questions? Hi, Adrian. Thanks for the, the talk. Still nice to see uh, how things are progressing. So uh, I have one question regarding the archive you would like to uh, provide, mm -hmm. which is as a scientist something that I'm looking for for a while. Uh, I'm not sure whether I correctly understood 
if it's already in production in Cameroon. Uh, so are you already collecting hot crosses right now or not? Uh, so so uh, are you talking now about the workload traces or are you talking about the uh, monitoring information within Chameleon? Let's say the cloud traces. The cloud traces. Yeah. So we are currently working with the uh, scientific working group to collect those traces uh, from other infrastructures. Collecting them from Chameleon is going to be a first step making them available, and that hasn't been done yet. At this point, we have um, a data format uh, that, that we're going to be collecting those traces in. But also, Chameleon is, like Grid 5000, this is a very unusual test bed, right? So those traces are not going to be as representative as they might be from, from other infrastructures. And I think, Pierre, you probably can say more about this, right? Yeah, so for example, Grid 5000 has traces on one of those grid uh, workloads, but there is a big caveat that it's not a typical grid or cluster. So I think similarly, uh, we'd like to have cloud traces from cl uh, infrastructures like Nectar or CERN, which you can really consider to be production. Okay, so and this is the current trends. Will Nectar provide such traces? Yeah, we are talking with them, so uh, mm -hmm. I'm hopeful that it will happen. Okay. And by all means, feel free to join the discussion because you know the, the format is important as well, right? Okay. So thank you. Thanks. No questions? Any other questions? Okay. Well, in that case, thanks everybody very much for coming. Thank you.